We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Go. Oh. Hi. When I was at school, at the end of every year, a headmaster who was as pompous Middle England and Brexit voting as they come used to deliver a speech to the whole student body. And every year, without fail, he would reach for the exact same joke. It would be delivered to the sixth form leavers about to make their way out into the world. That light at the end of the tunnel, he'd say. The tunnel referencing the black joylessness, with which I guess he presumed we'd all slogged out our years at the institution he headed. That light at the end of the tunnel may just be an oncoming train. Every year. He said this every year. And so a remark that could, at one stage, and I'm being generous here, have carried with it some trace of pub bore wit, soon became little but a pessimistic mantra that marked the start of a childhood summer, arriving with the depressing regularity of the train that it conjured. Yet, even things that we might choose to disagree with can seem like wisdom if heard enough times. My headmaster's warning waged a war of attrition on my otherwise optimistic nature, to the degree that it now snaps like a reflex. Light at the end of a tunnel, I hear. Hmm, I think. Oncoming train. And that is perhaps why I am viewing our upcoming May 11th re release date here in France with a degree of trepidation. Yes, it will be beyond lovely to discover again the world more than a kilometre away from our houses, to embrace our friends, to share a drink with more than just a celebrity square. But we still find ourselves a long, long way from normal, which for me is another way of saying I don't expect to be attending any live open mics for a while. With this in mind, besides being cautious of this latest train coming, our occupation for the near future remains as it has been, creating our own light against the tunnel darkness. Parasit Up has and continues to help us with this. And these video series and all who partake in them are instrumental for doing so. For helping us see each other. For helping us realise that the light at the end of the tunnel may not be daylight, but neither need it be an oncoming train. Instead, it can be our fellow travellers, who are down here with us, illuminating the dark. In fact, I have a seeking, sneaking suspicion my old headmaster would probably be proud of this, that Covid notwithstanding, the tunnel has no end but what we make. And sharing creation, sharing our light, is one of the best illusions we have of outside, for as long as we can maintain it. Anyway, uh, lesson in metaphor stretching over, all that remains is for me to introduce this week's future, uh, featured performer. Flora Hibbard is an extraordinarily talented singer-songwriter who's been playing guitar and writing songs since age 14. She played her first concert at the age of 16 and since then has toured in France, Sweden, Italy, Spain and Denmark and across the UK. In 2019, Flora was signed to UK-based indie label Clear Right Records and released her first EP, made with London-based producer J.C. Wright. She has been described in the music press as one of the foremost faces of a rising movement in contemporary folk music. Now, on her bio, it says that Flora currently lives in Paris, where she's working on her second EP, Archipelago, but I can reveal the truth that, over the last six, six weeks, she's actually been quarantined here with me and three others in Normandy and has just completed a home recorded album album called Shine a Signal which is now available on Bandcamp.
Seeing this take shape firsthand has been one of my great pleasures of this quarantine, or to return to that metaphor, one of my lights in this strange time. I hope you enjoy. But, but I just... Do not press it. But I, I, I just pressed it. I, I just... Oops. Oops? But, but, what do you mean, oops? Oh, I, shit. Uh, no. Listen carefully. You, you have, have to live inside, inside the box. box. <laughs> now, before it resets, in the meantime, if you can't the box, just keep breathing inside the box. If you can't <laughs> Keep breathing. Stay in the box. I got this.
Where did our spring go? Who stole it? Who prevented its flow? In March, the trees were naked. In April, leaves sprung in blossom. The sun shone so brightly, I thought, this is awesome. But who would profit from the unfolding leaves and flowers being kept in our lockdowns for weeks, days and hours? Who will give us in return the spring of 2020 that we lost in our personal chambers, homes, shelves, boxes and secret drawers? Will summer help us to open the windows to a new world filled with love, care, hope and concern? A summer of joy with new connections, creative thoughts, energy bounds and reflections. A season for a new start for those immersed in the mission and universal meaning of art. Who stole our spring? Stop that vaping! Who? Oh, oh. <laughs> hey there. Just caught me having a little 40 winks. Been on the range all day. But now that you're here... Time stretched out before us I'm remembering We can see from early Saturday Burn through the cash, the ash of illegal but tender sin The last one in the pack And there ain't no easy way back up the race but a wise and acceptance And a reason to be I loved each line and rhyme is not a sentence C'est la vie There is no great escape You've all seen Inception The dream within And the dream without a sound Accelerating into the next dimension Approach the speed of light then hang a sharp right just out of town ah! It's a wild ride and adventure Hold, hold on to your dream Arborescent dreams are rarely C'est la vie In days of old They told of scrolls to make gold As advertised on television Alchemy When all the threadbare shelves around you 
are empty Just add a bit of lead Five thousand loaves of bread You'll be free With a wild-eyed acceptance Some be some words to say There's got to be a better way There's something left But I won't play in settings Say you love me You'd all remember that when you're out on the range. It's lessons in the sunlight and memories in the moonlight. In the beginning. In the beginning. To start To start something that did not exist before To ignite a spark, an ember that illuminates a cold universe. The sun, the waterfalls, oceans of burning elements swelling in the constant creation of life in spirits, in, inside. There is a universe inside, a beginning. The spark that started the heart, churning the burning elements, swelling, spreading, through the body of life. In the beginning, life was a tree. In the beginning, the meaning of life was to be. We came from the sea. We came from the sky. We were the spark that traveled from a burning ocean.
intended in the beginning in the beginning in the beginning we were together one in the beginning this was a love poem in the beginning hate used to wake us from our dreams and now dreams only wake us from our hate. And in the beginning, these words were incriminate. I was afraid of being labeled militant. But it proves harder to harbor something that you thought you had discarded. I grew hard-hearted and bled often. My head often said, what have you got to live for? In the beginning, depression is the only lesson you learn in schools. And honestly, that degree don't save you from the lynching tree, so... So I guess that's where we meet. Because we were the spark that traveled from a burning sea. Don't you remember me? It was almost evening. I was running below the sky as pale as the open flesh of nectarines and things felt sore and white and weeping. Buildings rose with shoulders hunched, made castles in the air all hatched with bars of sun. Cobblestones ringed with rain beneath the litter, mascara smudged round their lachrymous eyes. The bridges were blinding and God had smoothed out the skin of the sand. At night I ran up and down the hours, and my fear clenched in my fist. Trees down on the street turned auburn, yellow wine colors and street light glare. The twigs spread wide like finger bones, and leaves ducked their downy heads between the buildings, very new and unsure how to live. I started to hurt from sitting too long, flesh pressed too thin against the bones, and there was nothing in the poem I wanted to tell you. I just sat sore and watched the bar cart shadows blur in the night, gin, wine, absinthe, and some dry sprig of flower, canary yellow, and tipping out of a shop glass behind me, Windows groaned, ill-closed, and the night got cold and crept in. Lights flickered, opened their eyes too wide. They tried to make me gleam. Hello.
Madre Tierra, Tonantzin, Pachamama, Mother Earth. In the silence of your branches, we hear your words, as I, my love, shall mourn for thee. Tonantzin, Mother Earth, let the absence of touch be retrieved in the warmth of your soil. Dig our hands in so deep, the alchemy of your womb turns fingers into roots, grounded amidst this insanity of grief. Hold our fragility of what we thought couldn't break from the weight of an invisible war. You are the original life cycle, the reminder of only two constants, a composting graveyard, a seedbed of growth, of hunger that waits to be fed by tomorrow's sun. Madre Tierra, Tonantzin, Mother Earth, root us to you, to this calm underneath the storm, dew on a silent, still morning, life buzzing just below the surface. You are the expansiveness of our contained, constricted bodies, of rhythms we took for granted, the magic of a hummingbird's migration, the freedom of movement, the interconnectedness of all life forms. Madre Tierra, Tonantzin, Pachamama, Mother Earth. In the silence of your branches, we hear your words as I, my love, shall mourn for thee. We touch your soil in honor of the bodies we could not hold nor properly prepare, could not kiss goodbye Touch our lips to outstretched hands, caress a forehead, whisper prayers of peace in unexpected last breaths. Our tears they cannot see. Madre Tierra, Tonantzin, we lay marigolds at your feet, underneath your swaying branches. Crack open our hearts to this collective grief. The roots of inequity exposed, cavernous wounds, safety nets washed away in the river's surge. This was not of your making. So much sorrow could have been prevented. And still, we are here, letting go of perceived control, accepting the offering of your stillness. Left with our essence, Plant our feet firmly inside your resilient core. May we move with the lightness of spring's renewal. I dream of dreaming, I dream of you Try to be simple, try to be true Town said it better than I ever could Try not to worry, try to be good But pause to watch the long night sky shifting Shifting, becoming dark, and like the light, we drift. 
slipped and dripped into the void beneath our feet. But love is sweet and time's the healer. You are the archipelago flung out on the water. I am the sea. You are unknowable to me. I had to get away. I couldn't take it any longer. I see it in the mirror and I hear it through the walls. And they will tell you at the end of it all. Forget your love, forget your promise. Please don't forget me when I'm out here howling. I didn't do it well, but I was trying, I was trying, I was trying. I'm running down the road far from all that had east. Can you hear it in the wind? It brings a different kind of peace If it's peace you're looking for I know a place beyond the trees Beyond the trees You feel it It is in the air It is everywhere I dream of dreaming, I dream of you Try to be simple, try to be true And town said it better than I ever could Try not to worry, try to be good And then a pause to watch the long night sky shifting Shifting, becoming dark And like the light We drift and drift into the void Beneath our feet But love is sweet and time's the healer Yes. 
so quiet The bonnie prince rides on the radio tide And he flows all around us and sweet and profound He says, I have made a pledge very much to everybody in that first half. Just an aside here about Flora's piece. We uh, recorded it today in the local church. The camera work was done by videographer Mary Yako. Well, I stood outside in the rain keeping a lookout for angry curates and the gendarme. Now, go grab yourselves a drink. You deserve it. Have a talk among yourselves, or if you're self-isolating, on your own, to yourself. And we'll see you all for round two. Blossoms are flying And that makes me cry But don't ask me why I couldn't tell you So I stayed in my shelter Didn't walk out in the world and I thought of my mother And how she endured And I thought of my beautiful friend And I thought of her daughter Coming into the world in the springtime When everything was quiet Except for the blossoms of blue Cast in marble by Benini with the miracle touch. Daughter of the river, when it's over, I will hold you, we will hold you. For we love you so much, small god of the blossoms of blue. in marble 
by Benini with the miracle touch. Daughter of the river, when it's over, I will hold you, we will hold you. For we love you so much, small god of the blossom with blue. Cast in marble by Benini with the miracle touch. Daughter of the river, when it's over, I will hold you, we will hold you. For we love you so much, small god of the blossom with blue. got it all wrong. When they itched, they thought it was their particular itch, their own particular patch of skin playing up. Maybe something embarrassing, maybe herpes or crabs. Itch was laughing. Itch knew something they didn't. He knew he was everywhere, in everyone, at the same time. Itch had seen long, long ago when the bison still roamed on the plains, when the peoples of the world still cowered in tents to shelter them from the wind or caves to shield them from the snow, Itch had detected some little part of them, infinitesimal and very ugly, that always, always would want that little bit more. Itch started small, an extra hunk of meat here, a larger share of the hunt there, but Itch, quiet, confident, knew that soon he would take over the world. An extra field here, a whole prairie there, a little island across the sea here, a whole continent there, a cotton plantation here, a whole people shipped in, in chains, to pick it there. Oh, Itch was laughing out loud. He could see another tiny greedy place inside the people of the world for machinery, not just any machinery, but every itchy person's hands stretching out for the most, the best, the fastest, above all, their own. Itch rubbed his hands with glee. The grey mill chimneys grew tall, the sky turned oily, the moon hid behind steel girders and cranes, skyscrapers blocked out the sun. And Itch howled with laughter when he spotted a hollow, flimsy group of people whose itch was greater than all the rest. The itch for power. Oh, how he helped them to lead, to abuse, to manipulate, to lie, to exploit, to annihilate. Itch rolled on the floor laughing. Then itch stopped. He saw he had been one-eyed. Everyone had stopped scratching. It wasn't that they didn't itch, that itch made sure of. It was that they couldn't scratch. Something had come 
to stop the world in its tracks. And then Itch saw with his other eye, the one that had been blind. He saw that some people, many, had never itched. He saw them dipping their toes in clear new water, the way they'd always longed to do. He saw them picking up chicken eggs and looking at their smooth brown texture. He saw others dancing on one foot, whirling dervishes, all alone in a crazed dance, with one hand waving at the stars. Itch saw that when the world stopped itching, a wave of something as bright and fierce as the sun warmed them with a heat so strong it radiated from their skin and merged with something so big, so luminous, that itch, shrunken, shriveled, desiccated, turned into near nothingness. Itch had always been in the wrong place. With the dawn, he knew it. Itch knew that he too, like all the rest, would have to change. Perhaps there was never a mother more loved. Bridget turned the rosary beads in her fingers, clinging, clutching the promise of salvation, treasuring the promise of salvation. Father, into thy hands, she tried to pronounce, but earthly words were no longer of her domain. She felt her life force being drawn up to her eyes. And through those eyes, she beheld a bammy light at the foot of the bed. A light that grew dazzling, irresistibly so. And when she gazed into that light, she saw a figure that she knew, that excited her, that inspired her. It was her Jesus in his luminous raiment, holding out his arms to her in the most welcoming of welcomes. Her Lord had come. Death was a friend. Freely, she lifted back the restraining bed covers and floated out of herself into that light of lightness where her earthly family sat on, weeping, wiping, choking, as if the river banks of their souls had burst over her empty body. Full of such humour, and perhaps the miserablest man in the whole French capital or suburbs was I, one sultry dog day, after much perambulation, toiling along the dirty little Rue Saint Thomas de l'Enfer, among civic rubbish enough, in a close atmosphere, and over pavements hot as Nebuchadnezzar's furnace, whereby doubtless my spirits were little cheered, when, all at once, there rose a thought in me, and I asked myself, What art thou afraid of? Wherefore, like a coward, dost thou forever pip and whimper, and go cowering and trembling? Despicable biped, what is the sum total of the worst that lies before thee? Death? Well, death. And say the pangs of Tophet, too, and all that the devil and man may, will, or can do against thee. Hast thou not a heart? Canst thou not suffer whatsoever it be? And, as a child of freedom, though outcast, trample Tophet itself under thy feet, while it consumes thee. Let it come, then. I will meet it, and defy it. And as I so thought, there rushed like a stream of fire over my whole soul, and I shook base fear away from me forever. I was strong of unknown strength, a spirit, almost a god. Ever from that time 
the temper of my misery was changed. Not fear or whining sorrow was it, but indignation and grim, fire-eyed defiance. Thus had the everlasting no peeled authoritatively through all the recesses of my being, of my me, and then was it that my whole me stood up in native, God-created majesty, and with emphasis recorded its protest. Such a protest, the most important transaction in life, made that same indignation and defiance in a psychological point of view be fitly called. The everlasting no had said, Behold, thou art fatherless, outcast, and the universe is mine, the devil's, to which my whole me now made answer, I am not thine, but free, and forever hate thee. It is from this hour that I incline to date my spiritual new birth or baphometic fire baptism. Perhaps I directly thereupon began to be a man. Trust me, dude. I'm just as surprised as you are that I ain't dead. You think I would have said that shit about me loving you if I thought I wasn't gonna get eaten by skeletons? I may have started the fucking skeleton apocalypse when I dripped blood on that skeleton head, but I still ain't into dudes. I mean, yeah, if we were the last two human beings on the planet, my position might soften a little bit, but that's called the end of days, dude, which is basically anything goes. How the fuck should I know I ain't dead? You think cause I got my ass kicked by a skeleton one time in the woods, I can read the brains now and shit? I've been focused on revenge. I figured after that butt kicking, maybe I could start small and work my way up to a full grown skeleton. Like maybe I'd take on a few child sides once first and build my confidence. Yeah, the only problem is when the door to my cell opened up, there was a mini skeleton. Like maybe a six year old girl skeleton. So you think that might have been my chance. But I can see in the little fingers that that she-devil was packing something, and if it was a knife, I was pretty sure nobody had watched that thing for like 400 years. It'd be the rustiest thing in the history of iron. And it's not like I can just go to the doctor to get a tetanus shot or some shit since all the docs are turning skeletons now too. Now fuck you, Doug. You ain't no superhero neither. You woulda did what the skellies told you to do, you little bitch. So yeah, she led me past a couple million skellies around their campfires, and I figured I was going to be lunch in some stew pot, and I got so scared I shot myself a little bit, but the puny skeleton girl just waved her gross rusty spoon at me, so I kept moving my feet forward. Now we reached this little private room, and there was one skeleton with no jaw, wearing some kind of robe, and a big altar in the middle, and the moonlight was coming in a little cobwebby window. Okay, Doug, you dickhead. Shit's about to get a little weird. And if you laugh, I swear I'm gonna show up at your house and take a shit on your pillow. Promise me you won't laugh, you jackass. I will crap on your pillow. Say it. Say, I won't laugh no matter what comes out of your mouth. Fucking say it, Doug. Good. Well, first thing, about six skeletons circled around me right by the altar and they all started ripping my clothes off. Yeah, man, they were vicious. Those dickless fuckers got a lot of strength in their hands. Damn near tore me in half when my underwear band wouldn't break. And I felt the cold skeleton fingers all over my body, and I got the heebie-jeebies again, and man, it was the fucking worst. Okay, fine, Professor Balsack. My clothes are indeed intact, as you have so cleverly noted. I think maybe this skeleton wizard told me to take them off. As we have seen, I am susceptible to his powers. So it's not like I got some fetish for skeletons or some shit. I mean, that would be a bit perverted, right? And I ain't no weirdo. But sometimes the body just reacts to situations, and it don't mean shit. So when I took my clothes off, standing in the middle of all those skeletons, I gotta admit, I got a semi, but whatever, it ain't weird. Our bodies just mess with us sometimes, right? Hey, was that a laugh, Doug? You fucking promised not to laugh, you rat bastard. Next time you start to feel one of those coming on, you go take a hard look at your pillow and imagine me dropping a steaming coil on it. I take back that shit I said about how you might have a shot if we were the last two dudes on Earth. My new position is die alone, you son of a bitch who laughs at his best friend when he's trying to say some vulnerable shit. Well, next I lay down on my belly on the altar like I was told. The skeletons were all chanting shit and the moon got real bright and there was this crazy pulsing red light again. The wizard was right in front of me and he drops his robe like it's some kind of big deal but he just looked like a normal skeleton underneath to me. And then he started walking uh, around the altar and... <coughs> oh yeah, sorry about that. Uh, what I said was... <coughs> oh for fuck's sake, Doug, can't you read between the lines? There was a huge pain in my ass, okay? Like someone was sticking a pineapple up there. 
I passed out after about 30 seconds and woke up in this weird room with a new understanding of the pain of childbirth. You don't think... You don't think the skeleton wizard stuck himself up my ass, do you? I mean, that's impossible, right? C'est une invitation au voyage. C'est un glissement. C'est un chuintement. C'est le vent qui s'engouffre en moi et me remplit de vie. Mon silence C'est être Juste Là Un bel après-midi d'été à écouter les bruits du monde Accepter, accepter de renaître toujours. Et croire en la vérité du moment, du mouvement. Mon silence, c'est imaginer une ligne de fuite qui s'étire à l'infini dans un souffle. I've been inside all day and the sky is calling blue far above. I ask if you want to come with me, you say no, and a tiny curl of relief seeds within my heart. I will walk down a path through a large park with a pond and established trees. Little brown ducks paddle on the water, towing ducklings on invisible strings. I walk past the trees and the birds and the sky and all the things that I never noticed before, potatoes boiling on the stove, the wine yellow tang of asparagus, oily reek of fish. We cook well together, you outside at the grill and me inside with the knife and the endless piles of vegetables, fruits of the earth. We always cook more than we need. Sharp hiss and sizzle of the grill. I hear the meaty thunk of fish falling on flame, the chalking sizzle of its skin spluttering salt and black a memory of the silver quick sea of last summer. It smells like days at the beach. I can't wait to get outside. Outside where the sky sings and the clouds pirouette around an indifferent sun. I walk, letting my arms swing at my side. I count the seconds as they swing past, one, Two, three, repeat. It seems important that I count the number of steps that it takes to get from the front door to the park gates, and then the number of steps that it takes to get from the park gates to the pond where the little brown ducks swim, and the number of steps that it takes to get to the place where cherry blossoms trees grow across the path a glorious bridge between heaven and earth.
The place where cherry blossom dreams form a tunnel over the path. Where cherry blossom trees surround me on all sides, holding me close. And then I fly. My footsteps are no longer chained to the grey concrete of the path. A golden coronet of bees swells above my head and in that instant I am crowned queen of my own life, of my body, of this tunnel of trees in the heart of a German park. I am inviolable, invincible, eternal. My heart beats the song of now. I become, I become, I become. My lungs sack the gassy sugar of the petals and silver wings burst from my heels, dancing me over the ground through this tunnel that passes slow, fast in a blur of blossom and tiny green leaves and blackened branches that explode each year with beauty, inevitable as the setting sun. I do not think of ventilators as I dance through this candy pink air. My warm skin refuses the thought of those who remain forever cold. I am immune to the dark shadows that cling to the base of every tree, every flower with its own mirror image hidden in the black mosaic on the ground. But I feel protected here. I feel safe. Earlier in the day, we had gone out to buy groceries. I was driving you beside me in the front seat. An everyday task has become monumental, a quest something to survive. I imagine my hatchback as a camouflaged Humvee. You have the GPS open and it blip, blip, blips. When do I turn? I ask. Soon, you reply. That's not precise enough, I say. You are silent. More silence. Am I annoying you? Yes. We buy the potatoes and the green asparagus that stinks of spring and the heavy fillets of fat pink fish and bring them home. We cook well together. brings us to the end of this week's Paris It Up. And I just want to say thank you again to everybody who contributed. And thank you especially to Ed Bell, who's worked more tirelessly than anyone stitching your videos together and keeping the fire burning. Metaphorically. Now, I thought a lot about how to end this evening. And in the end, I decided that the best thing to do was to quote the last lines of the film American History X. I'm quoting them now. It's always good to end on a quote. Someone else has already said it best. So if you can't top it, steal from them go out strong.